So uh, today I'm going to um, talk about a chip we've uh, worked on with AFI, but uh, I'll give you guys some background on um, uh, the genomics and the complications of, uh, of organ transplantation. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about some sequencing and the overlap with GWAS as well. So as a bit of perspective, the, uh, the first heart transplant about uh, 45 years ago, the, um, the, uh, the lifetime of the graft was, was less than a week. And with, with the advent of better patient uh, management, uh, surgeries, and immune expression therapy, the, um, the average lifetime of, of a heart graft is, is now about 10 years, which, which sounds reasonable. But um, when you consider a, a child who is a heart transplant, they'll probably need three to four over the course of, of their lifetime. And it's pretty similar with, uh, with liver. And lung is actually less. It's about uh, five or six years. And ki kidney is, uh, is much better, but uh, there, there are still issues. So the survival rates, uh, as I mentioned, uh, are organ specific. And uh, the costs are huge to society. Uh, heart transplant is uh, almost a million US dollars. And these people are on immune expression therapy for the rest of their lives. And there's a lot of complications with um, with uh, nephrotoxicity and uh, drug-induced liver damage. Uh, the, the numbers of people on a waiting list uh, in the US is, is huge. It's about 110,000, uh, of which about uh, 7,000 die every year. And the, uh, the gap is growing between those on, on the waiting list, especially for kidney, where there's a lot of chronic kidney disease and a lot of diabetes, which is really impacting this delta here. And then the, the living donors and cadaver donors, while, while they are increasing, uh, they're, they're not keeping up at all with the, um, the, the new number of patients coming on the waiting list. So the genetics of transplant, we know that HLA is very, very important for, uh, for hemopoietic stem cell and, and kidney. Uh, it is important for, for the other organs as well, but it, it's typically not used. So for, for lung, heart, um, it, it, it's typically not done in most centers. And for liver, it's basically just matched on, on, on blood type. Uh, we know that in graft-versus-host disease, uh, which is basically the, the graft uh, stem cells are, are um, uh, basically attacking the recipient um, uh, certain tissues, uh, it's absent the monozygotic twins. Um, but in, in uh, siblings and first-degree relatives, e even when they're perfectly HLA-matched, you still see graft-versus-host disease, which is indicative of non-HLA uh, Im Im immune response. And there's also, uh, we, we know that females ha tend to have a much worse outcome when they receive male organs, which, and, and there's evidence for Y chromosome um, allogenicity there as well. And when we look at large-scale epidemiological data from uh, UNOS, uh, which is a registry of events for transplant, we can see that the um, non-immunological -immun factors, such as the ischemia time uh, during cadaver harvesting, that, that's pretty important. There's also, HLA is very important, but there's a lot of non-HLA components at play as well. And we've never really had the tools or the numbers to, to try and um, to get at uh, what, what these non-MHC um, genetic associations are. So we know from large-scale whole genome sequencing that um, when you do de novo assembly, the, the average human has you know, five plus megabases of, of content, which, which doesn't turn up in most reference um, databases. So, so BGI were one of the first groups to do de novo assembly uh, across, different, um, across different populations, and they found a lot of unique content which was not on, um, on, on the reference genome. And they showed by RNA sequencing and other means that a, a lot of these were true genes. So in the context of, re of re uh, rejection, some, some of these genes may be allogenic. So if you receive an organ from someone who has some, some of these genes, and we know it's expressed in that given organ, it, it may be a source of, uh, of allogenicity. We also know the common CNV uh, deletions. Uh, there are instances where, where you can have two copy deletions of a gene and still be functionally uh, fine. But uh, th these can be important in transplantation as I'll show you shortly. And then loss of function variants. These would be classed as either a, a copy number variant or a single nucleotide variant or a SNP, which ablates all or part of a function of a given gene. So Daniel MacArthur had a paper in Science uh, a couple of years ago now where he looked at the first 105, 185 human genomes uh, that were sequenced from the 1,000 genome. And he went a lot, to a lot of trouble to basically 
assess the loss of function variance um, in these 185 individuals, and he looked using orthogonal platforms to see A, where they have a proper um, call, and then B, uh, where they actually loss a function, trying to integrate as much expression uh, data as possible to actually um, to, to truly validate that they were LOF. And then Steve McCarroll in, uh, in Boston, he, he looked at uh, using AFI 5 and AFI 6, some, some of the older GWAS arrays. He just asked the question for very commonly deleted genes uh, as picked up uh, on these GWAS arrays, was there an association with uh, graft versus host disease? So he looked at six genes uh, ranging from about 100 amino acids up to over 500, roughly 10 kilobases up. Some of these are expressed in all tissues, and then some are, are specific for for uh, liver um, and, and, and some other organs. And he basically found that in uh, HLA-matched individuals that uh, one of these genes, UGT2B17, where the donor had zero copies and where the recipient had one or two copies, that the, there was uh, a reasonably strong effect in odds ratio of about two for, um, for GVHD. And they went on to show that there was indeed epitope, and uh, they showed some pr pretty convincing functional data. And, and th this was in over 100 individuals, or 1,000 individuals, so, so it, was, it was a pretty, pretty well-powered study. So this basically shows you that uh, in a graft versus host disease where the donor is missing a gene, that you can elicit immune response um, where the recipient has one copy of that gene. And then in rejection, you would imagine that a donor has either one or two copies and the recipient has zero copies and, and that this, this would elicit an immune response as well. So with this in mind, I, I wanted to, to try and sequence um, uh, one of the studies we had in UPenn. Uh, so I, I designed a, um, an exome chip plus added in a lot of uh, non-exomic content uh, for promoter regions we know are important in transplant and a lot of HLA here new onset of diabetes after transplant. A, a lot of these loci are, are not very well covered on, on uh, exome sequencing arrays. And then we spiked in a lot of extra baits for these homozygous deletion CNVs from efforts in Children's Hospital and, and, and BGI. And this was sequenced in a, an NIH perspective study, the CTOT3, uh, for, with lots of different uh, solid organs in there. And we, we had a lot of urinary markers, expression, et cetera. And then we basically wanted to um, to try and find some of these loss of function variants and actually look in the sera of these individuals and see was there allo antibodies that may be underpinning rejection. So I'll just uh, kind of skip through this, but th this is basically just a, a CNV uh, pipeline that we developed to try and find some of these homozygous deletion CNVs using expression data. And this is a homozygous deletion uh, CNV in uh, complement factor age related three a very commonly deleted region. It comes up in, um, in a number of autoimmune diseases. So this was in a heart recipient who, who did have, have a severe rejection. And then we can see in, in the, uh, the sequence traces that um, there's good representation in the donor at about 45x, and, and it's missing in, in the recipient. And this is actually a pretty important gene because um, it, it has come up before in, tra in kidney transplantation where um, a 13-year-old girl was shown to have, uh, she rejected her first kidney and, was reje uh, and wasn't in, uh, in the stages of uh, late rejection on, on her second transplant. And she was shown to have, uh, she was shown to have donor specific antibodies to common factor age related three and one. And she was actually treated with a monoclonal antibody to terminal complement, which, which actually, uh, it actually rescued her, her, her phenotype here. So to try and discover as many of these as we could, you, you know, we, even with the cost of sequencing uh, coming down, you know, we, we, we wanted to try and uh, put together you know, 20, 30, 40,000 uh, samples across as many transplant cohorts as we could. So we set up a uh, consortia. It's a terrible name, but it was, uh, was all we could come up with at the time. And basically the idea was to try and uh, aggregate the existing GWAS and sequencing data and then to design a chip to, uh, to sequence as many of the, um, the DNA cohorts that were out there for, um, for transplantation. And we really tried to exploit a lot of the existing DNA in HLA labs and in organ procurement organizations such as the Gift of Life. So there is... Um, there's uh, specific organ groups here, and then there's a few overarching groups like HLA, pharmacogenetics, and a lot of the analyses uh, pipelines as well. 
So we designed a, uh, uh, an Affymetrix uh, custom chip for, for transplantation. We borrowed very heavily from uh, the UK Biobank and from um, the Axiom Biobank as well. So this, this was quite appealing to us because uh, you know, we wanted to try and get in as many uh, EQTL markers. Uh, our populations were mixed, so we, we did want African, European, and, and Asian content as well. And then uh, for, for transplantation uh, pharmacogenetics, there, there's a lot of uh, steroids and immune suppression therapies. So we really want to make sure a lot, a lot of those key um, enzymes, um, those loci were really well covered. And then we put in a lot of custom content as well for, um, for transplant specific efforts. So for loss of function, uh, we actually had a, a little bit of an update uh, after the UK Biobank chip. So Donald MacArthur put in some additional loss of function content from uh, more exomes that uh, he had access to in, in Boston. And then as I mentioned, we put in a lot of these uh, um, drug metabolism uh, markers more specifically for, for, for transplant. And then um, uh, all, all of the indels, coding SNPs, et cetera, uh, we, we tried to update that as best as we could. And then we did an, an analysis of about 600 um, PubMed um, articles that, that were specific for transplantation, just, just to try and pull in specific RSIDs just for better meta-analyses, et cetera, et cetera. And then we did, we borrowed very heavily from the UK Biobank for HLA, here and MHC, and then we supplemented that with type 1 diabetes genetics consortia and as many other HLA um, loci as we could. So this basically is just uh, a basic uh, coverage for Illumina, the, the Omni 1 million versus the transplant chip for, um, for across the MHC region, and these are um, uh, African American admixed uh, Caucasian and Asian populations there. So it, it's a little bit better for uh, for uh, MHC, but for, for KIR, which, which is very important, they interact with HLA class one, and it, it turns out that the, it's really becoming apparent that they're, they're very important in transplantation. So we can see in the, um, this is the Illumina one million here versus the transplant chip here. Uh, and again, these are the same populations as before. So we do have much better coverage uh, this is 1% uh, uh, frequency, 5% frequency here. This is across the whole cure region, which, which is roughly uh, 250 kilobases. And then this is just in the exons. Oh, there's 13 genes in cure and two, two pseudogenes. So we, we do have much better coverage here, which um, we're, we're pretty happy about for the, um, for the interaction analysis between HLA and cure. And then this is just some broad genome-wide coverage metrics here for the different populations. So this is Caucasian, uh, African-American, African, and uh, admixed, and then Asian here. So it, it's pretty comparable with the Illumina 1 million. Because we put so many rare loss of function um, variants in here, they took a little bit more uh, features, if you like. So if we'd went with more established uh, SNPs, we, we probably could have got another 50,000 in there. But we, we were very, very... Um, insistent that we, uh, we spiked in as much loss of function content as we could. So just to tell you a little bit about some of the groups uh, in the Kidney Consortium, there's a Wellcome Trust Case Control Consortium 3, uh, which is about 2,800 or, uh, recipients, 2,800 donors. Uh, this data we made uh, available through the Wellcome Trust um, along with phenotypes in, in due course. Uh, this is done on Infinium 660, but it's uh, currently been imputed to uh, 1,000 genome. Uh, and then DCAF, this is the largest um, genomic study of transplantation in, in the United States. Um, so it's roughly um, over, just over uh, 4,500. Then Vanderbilt, through their biobank and other efforts, um, they have about 1,200 kidney individuals. And then GOCAR is, uh, is a Mount Sinai based effort with GATAs in Holland. And then CHOP and PEN, there's a, a few more studies have come in on the kidney effort, and then there's, uh, we have a few collaborators who, who uh, we're going to use uh, their DNA for follow-ups. So we're basically imputing right now, we've imputed about 15,000 of the 27,000 samples using uh, 1,000 genome uh, for shape of 2 uh, and impute. Um, but then we're, our, our next effort, we're basically doing um, UK 10K, Go Netherlands, and 1,000 genome um, for the entire 27,000 samples. So right now we're at the stage where we've harmonized a fair number of the phenotypes. Uh, transplant is extremely complicated for, um, 
for, mar for harmonizing phenotypes, just because there's so many covariates. That a lot of these people are extremely sick at the time of transplant. They're on very powerful drugs, and, uh, and there's a lot of um, a lot of harmonization issues. But um, five-year survival, one-year survival are, are kind of pretty easy. Some, someone's alive or they're, they're not alive. If 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 the if they've died, there's um, you know, there's a lot of covariates we, we have to build into that. Uh, time to first rejection is, is also a pretty clean phenotype, assuming uh, compliance is good. And then new, new onset of diabetes after transplant is a very, very common problem. It's actually one of the major issues now post-transplant. These people get accelerated diabetes, accelerated atherosclerosis, and there appears to be very, uh, a strong genetic component to that. Then, as I mentioned, drug-induced liver damage, nephrotoxicity. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of other phenotypes which, uh, which we have under analysis as well. But uh, HLA, cure, and, and pharmacogenetics are, um, are kind of our main, main efforts right now. This is a bit of a busy slide, but this basically just shows you the, the kidney groups, how many we have, heart. We, we have a very decent um, collection of very, very well phenotyped heart studies heart transplant studies, and then we have liver and lung as well, and we're, we're, we're trying to expand the, these numbers. So for the loss of function pipeline, I mentioned for the sequencing that we had, uh, we generated a lot of uh, LOF uh, candidates uh, there through CNVs, SNVs, and SNPs. And these, these have been put through uh, GTEx and other expression uh, resources. And uh, we're, we're doing the exact same thing now with the GWAS data. You know, it's not going to be as granular, but with, with a better imputation, we, we can come up with two-copy loss of function in, uh, in these uh, paired individuals. And then we, because we have sera on a lot of these individuals, we can actually follow them up to see are there allo antibodies present. Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll actually just skip this uh, shortly. So with these loss of function, uh, candidates, we, we then take the sera and we can put them on um, allo antibody arrays or peptide arrays. So quite similar to printing uh, photolithography onto um, nucleic acid on, onto slides, you can do the same thing with amino acids. And you, uh, th these are 2.9 million peptide um, arrays. They're 12 mers that you can space over uh, over a whole array. And then we've been doing a lot of um, customer raised roughly 175,000 um, peptides to basically interrogate these loss of function candidates and actually see are there allo antibodies over the course of, of, of these series. I'll just go back a bit. And then we're also doing RNA sequencing on some of these heart biopsy tissues um, just to actually see are the LOFs, um, are they manifested at an RNA level? And then uh, we, we can basically follow the biopsies across, in this case, these a uh, couple of individuals who had a severe rejection at uh, month six. And then we, we can basically use the GWAS data, the expression data, and then the allo antibody data to come up with, um, you know, from, uh, from DNA through to, uh, you know, potential phenotype of, of rejection. Okay, and uh, we basically, we're also, the, the, these are kind of commonly, um, commonly observed uh, antibodies in, in transplantation, and uh, we're, we're hoping to add to this list. Uh, as, as I mentioned, uh, beyond HLA, there's, there's, a lot of these, um, there's a lot of these genes that, that we think are very, very important in, uh, in transplantation. And uh, I'll follow up just by, by thanking um, uh, so Teresa Webster and uh, Jan Tao Lau in uh, AFI were really, really immense on this project. And uh, one of my uh, students, um, Rose, Rose Lee, she did uh, a lot of this work. And these are the team in CHOP and Penn. And then we had uh, some of the key investigators in, uh, in the consortia as well. With that, I thank you. Cheers.